The member for Bruce. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, today, today, in fact, Australian citizens are being tried in a court in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. And these include a number of my constituents and two of my friends. They've been charged with fake, trumped-up charges, criminal charges, of things like incitement and fermenting social disorder, or at least that's what we think they've been charged with. We don't actually know, because the only reports have come second and third hand of these charges. The only notification appears to be a piece of paper that was nailed on the office of a banned political party in Cambodia. Uh, but I do know through a series of um, pressure and adventures now in the last couple of months that uh, the Australian ambassador has spoken directly with the Minister for Justice in Cambodia about these charges. They won't give details of what they are, because apparently they say you have to appoint a lawyer to go to the court, which has other issues I'll get to. Um, but these people, of course, are not actually in Cambodia. They're safe here in Australia, and in most cases they haven't been to Cambodia for years or decades. It includes Hong Lim, who served for 20 years as a Victorian State Member of Parliament. He retired at the last election, Hamara Inn, and others who I know. And others around Australia, I might add, who I haven't met but have heard of. Uh, why is this happening? Well, it's a new tactic. It's an authoritarian tactic by authoritarian governments to try and silence dissent and criticism of their regimes and human rights abuses overseas. In this case, it's being perpetrated by Hun Sen's gangster regime. It's not unique, DFAT told me. I asked them that. I thought, oh, well, maybe there's authoritarian conferences where dictators go and have workshops and give PowerPoints to each other and swap tactics and techniques. We wouldn't be invited, of course. Um, but it's now happening. Hun Sen's doing this, this little trick to hundreds of people across the world, in America, Europe, um, across the world, anywhere where people speak up for human rights and democracy. And they're targeting people for, just for speaking up in support of those values to try and shut down criticism now in the diaspora communities part of a deliberate strategy of foreign interference, which I'll get to. In a sense, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's a kangaroo court. I mean, it's silly. It's a foregone conclusion what will happen. They'll be found guilty and sentenced to jail and impose ridiculous fines that they'll never pay. But there are serious consequences for the people affected. Because if that sticks, then they'll need to declare a criminal record when they travel to places. It'll complicate their ability to travel to the United States and places, and, you know, it'll fill out the form and wriggle out of it. But if these fake crimes stick, more importantly, perhaps, I mean, it will restrict the ability of Australian citizens to travel to many places in Southeast Asia where they might have extradition treaties with Cambodia. Australia, I think, only has a treaty around um, sex crimes and so on. It doesn't cover these sort of ridiculous offences that are not recognised in Australian law. But this is a political issue. It's not a legal issue. It's a political issue. And I expect, and these people, these Australian citizens expect, the elected government of Australia, Labor, Liberal, whatever they want to call themselves, to actually do their job and speak out and push back. This is foreign interference. It's an attempt to silence dissent and to restrict the ability of Australian citizens to speak up here in Australia in support of democracy and human rights, values which I think everyone in this place shares. It's political, not legal. As the member for Maribyrnong said yesterday, though, what we have is a government, the backbench of lions led by donkeys on the front bench. The foreign minister has said nothing. We've written, we've raised it with DFAT, I've met with her office. To their credit, DFAT, we had a good briefing. I won't talk about what happened in that briefing. But still nothing. Silence. I'll use the words of Hong Lim. He said he's thought about, his advice was he got given a list of lawyers by the government. And he's taken advice and he's concluded, I think rightly, that to get a lawyer is tantamount to accepting the Phnom Penh court's jurisdiction and legality over this case. This is very much a political show trial that needs a political response in kind by the Australian government. With or without my lawyer's presence, as happened in the case on the 10th of February, another case, this kangaroo court will appoint a lawyer on his behalf. The lawyer then will plead guilty and beg the court for leniency, and the court will sentence me to a number of years in jail and impose a heavy fine of around 500,000 US dollars. It's not good enough that the Australian government and the disappearing foreign minister, I say disappearing because she was last seen, I think, in the seat of Gilmore, and when the Labor MP turned up to the announcement at the infrastructure, she literally ran away. She got in her car and drove back to Sydney and went, well, that's not happening. I mean, it's not good enough. And I thought, well, that's the last we'll hear from the Foreign Minister for the next three months. She does not speak up 
It's a good thing that the Australian ambassador has taken this up, but this is a political issue. The government must not just speak up, but they need to push back and work with like-minded countries. This is happening to other countries around the world. Why are we not coordinating with other countries who this is happening to in their citizens? The US Congress, the US government has spoken up. We should at the very least expect our embassy, they can't represent people in foreign countries, but they should be at every trial. They should be making statements publicly. We expect more. We should also be talking to all the countries in the world who have extradition treaties with Cambodia, saying and getting agreements that you will not pay any attention to these fake charges so our citizens can still travel freely and can speak their mind. You know, we hear always from the backbench when there's um, foreign interference and so on in other matters from other countries, well, where are the voices on Cambodia? But this latest tactic sits in a distinct context. We've seen for the last five years a concerted strategy which was exposed in a fantastic article released overnight by Jack Davies, an investigative journalist from Radio Free, Australia, Radio Free Asia. Um, little, little listened to in Australia, but often in Southeast Asian countries and many places, the only voice for democracy that gets through to people through the censors. And it's a terrific article that is exposed um, shocking statistics about the extent of the foreign interference by Hun Sen's CPP party in the regime in Australia. Tens of millions of dollars of property being purchased in the capital cities. As Kem Monavithia says, the daughter of the jailed opposition leader, Australia is the number one destination for Cambodian thugs. We have to question where the sources of dollars are coming from, uh, but it's pretty clear to everyone observing this that there is tens of millions of dollars of money gained from corruption and serious human rights abuses that's being used to buy property and find safe haven in Western countries. That's not on. Uh, the article quite aptly described, I've called it a gangster regime before, Hun Sen's regime, it is Hun Inc, Hun Manet, Hun To, all the family, all the crony connections, raping and pillaging money out of the Cambodian people. And it's shameful that this stuff is being used to buy luxury apartments and businesses, not only in my electorate, but in Sydney. In 2016, the son of the land management minister, Chair Sopara, purchased an $11 million house in Sydney in one of the most exclusive suburbs. Where did the money come from? I mean, clearly, if you trace this back, it's from human rights abuses and corruption. It's been well documented. The government needs to speak out and do something about this. The parliament, I hope, will soon introduce laws around Magnitsky sanctions. It was signed off in a bipartisan way by the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Committee, um, which should allow targeted sanctions uh, people. But there's anti-money laundering laws now. Now, I put some questions on notice to ministers last year. We got a response last week, a non-answer. They picked on a word in my question, like childish school children, to avoid answering it. They can't even bring themselves to say, yes, we're aware of these concerns, we will refer them to Austrac, we will refer them to ASIC, we will get the responsible agencies to look at them. They're like a bunch of children, not a government. This is a serious issue. It's affecting Australian citizens. They're about to be charged or jailed in absentia in foreign countries and the foreign minister has said nothing. Of course, if it was a different country, a larger country that started with C, you can imagine the queue of government backbenchers out there to beat their chests and bleat to carry on about foreign interference and freedom of speech, often quite rightly so. Well, where's the government when it's a smaller country but it still affects Australians? It's just not good enough. The running away foreign minister